Good morning, Friday morning, one of my favorite days of the week. Welcome to Insights Inc. This is where every Friday I'm sharing and hosting a, a webinar interview with some of the coolest people in the Indigenous community all across Canada, which has been pretty cool. And that's the, the benefit of the technology because I don't necessarily meet one to one with people I get to or I do meet one to one, but not in the same room. So I've been speaking with people all across Canada and I'm so excited to be doing that. So my name is Jessica Dumas. I'm a professional life coach of an online coaching program. I'm also a facilitator and a trainer. And so I have a workshop called uh, Essential Discussions for Indigenous Inclusion. And I came up with that because I'm getting a lot of requests to, from businesses to say, I want to work with Indigenous people. What do we do? And so it's an opportunity to talk about some of uh, Canada's history and some of the current affairs mostly regarding the relationship between Indigenous Canadians and the government of Canada. And so, um, and that's really heavy work. It's really heavy work. So, uh, but I really enjoy sharing and learning. So that's something that I do. I'm also going to be launching a training session for facilitation and presentation skills. And I'm so excited about that. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. And so I finally started putting together my curriculum and what that would look like. And, uh, and my essential discussions for Indigenous inclusion used to be called Indigenous Insights. However, I've been approached by the University of Winnipeg and they have a program called Indigenous Insights. And they approached me to say, hey, we'd love to do some training with you. And so I'm going to be one of their facilitators in their workshop. And they were fine with me having my workshop the same, but I didn't want to have it confusing. So, so I changed the name of my workshop and I'll be doing both. And I'm excited about that. So I wanted to share a few things. So yesterday, no, sorry, Wednesday, I don't know what day, the 21st of June was National Aboriginal Day. And the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, launched a announcement that morning that he's renaming that day the National Day for Indigenous Peoples. Is that right? National Indigenous Peoples Day. So a more inclusive name, wanted to be more uh, inclusive to uh, Indigenous, Métis, Inuit, all across Canada. So that's that's kind of neat. There's, you know, really a lot of things that are happening all across Canada. In Manitoba, the other thing that we did on the 20th of this month is the mayor, uh, Brian Bowman, and his, his uh, crew that he's collected as the Mayor's Indigenous Advisory Circle, which I'm a part of that group, has launched Winnipeg's Indigenous Accord. And that was really exciting because it's an opportunity for many businesses and organizations to say, I, I want to know more, I want to learn, and I don't know what I want to do right now for reconciliation. Some of them do know and some of them are taking actions, but it's an opportunity to create a little bit of accountability and an opportunity to celebrate. So people were invited to, um, to sign on to the accord. We had a ceremony at the Forks in Winnipeg to honor those who were signing. And it was a really beautiful ceremony. And um, many of the signatories on that day shared what their one year goal was in addressing truth and reconciliation in their workplace or in their business. So super exciting things. And if you want to follow more of that, you can check it out on my Facebook page, Insights Inc. with Jessica Dumas. I really encourage you to sign up and follow me there. And I try to share as much Indigenous activities and news all across Canada. Um, and in this work, I really acknowledge that uh, part of truth and reconciliation is really sharing what that truth is. And that truth is really sad and horrible times of what Canada has done to Indigenous people. And I think that a lot of times people in reconciliation say, well, what can we do? What can we do? And I'm always encouraging people that you need to learn the truth. We can't forget the truth in reconciliation. That's what I've been reminded. And so I'm spreading that message. But also, in um, as important it, as it is to acknowledge that, that history and to learn that history, I think it's also really important to acknowledge and recognize some of the leaders and the trailblazers that are coming out of this reclamation of empowerment. And, and th this is what makes me so excited. And this is why I continue to do these interviews. And so today I'm inviting in yet another award-winning Indigenous University student or grad, just a recent grad. 
And uh, I'm, I'm so excited to chat with her to hear her story. This beautiful Cree woman grew up in Northern Manitoba and she's gonna share with us what some of that transition has been like coming from the growing up in a First Nation community to the big city and, and kind of seeing what some of those changes or uh, hearing more about what those changes need to be. So I'm going to invite with me now, uh, I always get mixed up. How do I do this? This is Vanessa Tate. How are you? Good. Good. Good Thanks. morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here and uh, and just, you know, sharing and being open with me. So congratulations on your most recent graduation. It must be, it must feel good to be done. Yes, it's exciting. I'm <laughs> finally done that part. I'm, I don't know if I'll go for PhD, but we'll see. <laughs> I think it's a, if it's already up in up in the air that uh, it's probably something that's coming down the road. Mm -hmm. So I want to acknowledge that we have four people live right now, and so if anyone and there's I can see more people are coming on. So those who are attending live, you're welcome to say hello. You're welcome to join our conversation. If you have a question, just type it in. Let us know that you're here and what you're thinking, and uh, and we will start chatting with Vanessa. So, okay, so tell us a little bit about you. You just graduated. Where did you come from? How did this all start? Where did I come from? Uh, my name is Vanessa Tate. I am from Opaquanapian Cree Nation, and that's uh, in northern Manitoba, approximately 12 hours north of Winnipeg, if you jump in a vehicle and drive up there. I uh, actually uh, um, came to Winnipeg, um, first and foremost, not for education, um, just for personal things. And, you know, I uh, started school here with my Bachelor of Commerce degree with Asper School of Business and then um, furthered it to my master's degree at the University of Winnipeg. Um, but prior to that, um, I, like I said, I come from Opie Punapia and Cree Nation, which uh, we were, were just the newest uh, reserve, the 63rd First Nation. In December 2010, we became a First Nation. We used to be a part of Nisichuasi Cree Nation. So growing up, I was originally from the community of South Indian Lake. And as um, uh, in 2010, now, you know, we're um, Opipunapi and Cree Nation, but also the community of South Indian Lake. So I kind of mix both sometimes. I say South Indian and Opipunapi and Cree Nation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I grew up in uh, my community until I had to actually leave for high school. Um, as probably a lot of you are aware, Northern Manitoba communities um, do not have a lot of high schools in their communities, so we actually have to leave our homes, um, our families, and our comfort zone to attend uh, high school somewhere else. Um, so I attended in Frontier Collegiate Institute in Cranberry Portage, which is about an eight-hour drive uh, from my community. Um, so w when you're in, like, elementary school, are, are families already talking about that, about the kids leaving for school or what is that like? I think if I could remember that far back, um, we started, to, I think I started like talking about it in grades seven and eight. So when you get to junior high, you're kind of, actually my school went to grade 10, um, but when I was in grade nine, um, the vice principal had said that, you know, I should go for grade 10 somewhere else just because, you know, uh, um, the education, uh, I guess standards in the community. Uh, we had uh, we didn't have like the pre-calc or the we just had basic you know uh, English and math. And he wanted me to further pursue a little bit higher level. So I did leave for grade ten. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I cried for two weeks. So I was told oh, maybe you should go back home um, because it was it was it was a shock for me. Like I'm the baby of the family. My mom's only daughter. Um, so I was kind of, you know, missing home, missing family. And it was a little bit different because when we go to Cranberry, we actually stay in a residence. So, yeah, so it was kind of, you know, dormitory room. Um, so it's a little, it was a little bit of an adjustment for me. Um, so I actually went back home and then um, had to do grade 10 at home. And is it still the same for you there today that want to go to school? Yes, they actually still have to leave the community. Um, I, I, I believe that we still go to grade 10. And then after grade 10, um, for grade 11 and 12, they either go to Cranberry Portage, Thompson. Some people come to Winnipeg. 
Brandon. So if you're going to Cranberry, you're, you're doing more of a, um, the residents and as well as Southeast take some of our students, um, but some of them are in home placement. So. Wow. It just, that really uh, reminds me of how important it is to, to acknowledge your courage for doing that because like my teenage years were not fantastic either growing up in Winnipeg. It was rough, but but I did end up living with family and living with people that I was familiar with. And I was in the same city that I knew. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that drastic. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure to some people it still is, but that takes a lot of courage to, to try again after going home. And obviously your teacher uh, at high school saw some potential that want, wanted to make sure that you were aware of that potential. Oh, yes, definitely. I had to go back for grade 11. I had no choice. That's when it was like, okay, I either have to suck it up and, you know, finish or I'm not going to have an education. And for me, uh, education is, you know, has always been uh, something that, you know, has helped me in life. And I always say it's been my healing journey is going through school. Um, yeah. Good for you. That's amazing. So, okay, so with the Cranberry Portage. Uh, you finished your grade 11 there or you, what happened? I went to Cranberry and I finished grade 11 and 12 and I uh, completed my um, um, di uh, grade 12 diploma and I was also valedictorian for my class. So I uh, excelled pretty well there. Um, I got a, um, like I said, I was pretty good in school. Um, there was a lot of struggle though there too. Like it wasn't like education related like I didn't have a problem going to school and doing my work. It was more so I was really severely bullied in high school by, um, you know, a number of, uh, of my peers uh, because, you know, when Cranberry Portage, we have um, a number of communities that come together and, you know, uh, for the first time living together and stuff like that. So we, unfortunately, yeah, there's some, you know, bullying that happens and different things. So, yeah, I was extremely bullied in high school, but, you know, it's still, I still stuck it out and was able to, you know, go to school, finish school and, you know, finish with a very uh, amazing grade. So good for you. That's, that's so incredible that you were able to, to focus on your grades and to focus on your, your work, because not many people can do that, right? Like life can be really hard and really hurtful and painful. So what was it that really how did you manage to say, you know, this really sucks. I don't like it, but I'm going to do this anyway. Like what was your driving force? I think, like I said, for me, um, like my parents have always instilled, you know, education and um, like my dad was a journeyman carpenter. He finished school um, and they always instilled that, you know, education is going to, you know, get me somewhere in life. So um, they've, uh, they, they, just continue to, you know, support me and encourage me. And as well as uh, when I was in school, a lot of my teachers, um, you know, saw some potential in me. So that kind of helped me as well and supported that kind of, you know, balanced the, the other stuff that was occurring. But um, I think all their support and their inspiration and kind of, you know, showing me where I can go in life and different things like keeping, you know, I guess keeping uh, the path forward on how, uh, what I was going to be doing in life and the different things that I could, you know, become. So it was kind of, you know, coming from um, a small community, not really seeing the outside world and then going to Cranberry and kind of seeing a little bit of it. But then, you know, some of the, you know, teachers showing me that, you know, there, there's more to, to the world out there. So that kind of was my drive to say, okay, I'm going to keep going, keep going. And as well as, you know, I have, I've had, you know, um, just, you know, watching different, um, as well as uh, people who, who graduated as too. So it was kind of, you know, that's my inspiration was others that have gone before me. Mm -hmm. So community, good for you. That's, mm -hmm. oh, one of the challenges of doing this online is I always wish I can hug you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you had this motivation. Did you go back home after you graduated and, and then to university or what happened after that? So upon graduating, I actually had, um, I uh, got a scholarship for um, accounting because I was kind of interested in business. Uh, 
right, you know, from in high school. I wanted to be a teacher, but um, my parents had uh, started a small business. Like my mom had a laundromat and my dad had a, uh, a construction company. Um, they're good at what they do. It was just the business stuff that they were really uh, struggling with, like uh, just, you know, the basic business. And they did, did their amazing customer service. It was just uh, the other, you know, accounting, financial, tedious stuff uh, that comes with running a business. So that kind of, you know, looked. I, I saw a gap. I was like, hey, maybe I should go into business because, you know, that I knew that that was going to help our communities. So that was my drive to, you know, kind of pursue business. So I applied into Brandon University at their uh, Bachelor of Business Admin um, and was accepted. So um, upon completing my university, I did attend uh, Brandon. So I was 18 when I uh, went into university in Brandon. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I started my journey off with the university. Mm -hmm. And so what was that transition like? So Brandon's a little bit bigger than Cranberry Portage, so it's more city, right? Mm -hmm. what, yeah, what again, it was, a, again, a big, a little bit of a big step for me because I was like, okay, not only am I, at least within Cranberry, you still kind of had people that were from your community and you still kind of, you know, had, you know, your... Uh, indigenous student group um, because majority was indigenous. Uh, then when I went to Brandon, it was a little bit different. I was I was staying in a dorm, which is for a Cowan. Um, I had one friend that came with me, but it was a little bit different for me. Like I had longer hair at the time, and I always wore braids. So um, I started, you know, uh, going to class and realized that I was the only indigenous woman sitting in my business admin classes. So it was kind of a little bit awkward for me at first. I was really shy um, and I didn't really talk much. Uh, and then, you know, further to that, I uh, um, didn't like the dorm. So we did move, uh, me and my friend moved into an apartment. Um, and then so we, I was able to kind of, you know, get a little bit, at least a home base rather than dormitory. Um, but the yeah there was really intense racism and discrimination there like um as an indigenous uh um person who did like you know i i always put two braids because i just didn't know how to fix my hair so um i was you know i would walk to school and i'd be called you know a squaw you dirty indian and literally like people would like drive by and make the little ah, noise so it was a little bit different for me and i was really like I was like, why are people so mean? Like, I couldn't understand it at first because, you know, coming from my community and being so close knit and, you know, people uh, taking care of one another, you know, being very kind to one another. Then going to Cranberry, there was a little bit of bullying, but still, like, we still, you know, stuck together. And I, it was still familiar for me. Yeah. To now going to Brandon, to a whole different uh, mindset and, you know, experiencing racism and discrimination at a whole other level that I, I just, I, no one ever really prepared me for it. So I was kind of really shocked at like, okay, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it was, it was, it was a little bit of a, it was, it was, it was tough, but I did have some friends there that, you know, kind of helped me, but I guess like with Brandon, uh, during the regular session, there's not a lot of Indigenous students, but come like the spring session because they have the pen program and stuff. It's a little bit there's a little bit more um, uh, Indigenous um, students that do come to university the, there. The pet program? Did you say what's that? The pet. The it's it's a uh, a program that is for Northern uh, teachers, so they're able to teach during the year, and then I think May, they leave and they go to Brandon University, and then they take some of the education courses, and they it, it helps them to become a teacher, to get their teaching degree. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so that's kind of what it was. And then um, I was actually also, uh, as an Indigenous woman, I, I took an evening course, so I walked to school. It was only two blocks away, so, you know, I didn't think anything of it, uh, but there was this one time uh, I was chased by two uh, younger uh, white males, and that was really scary for me. I ran. Uh, I was, like, holding my backpack, and I was like, I can't drop my books. These cost me money, but I, like, need to run so I saw two people that were uh coming out of the street and I just basically ran towards them and I just grabbed them and I'm like they're like what's going on and I couldn't really catch my breath but that was really scary for me so I kind of it really I guess for me 
traumatized me a little bit. And then, you know, I, I did unfortunately leave Brandon University. Uh, just it was just too much for me. So, and and what year was that? Mm, wow, that was in two thousand. I believe two and three. I can't remember. Two thousand one is when I graduated high school. So, it was around a couple of years after that. Yeah. That's amazing. Like it's, it's, it's so, it's still shocking to me. Just like how you said, how could, why are people so mean? Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. so shocking to me every time I hear these stories because people are so mean sometimes and it's good for you for like, uh, you've got so much courage and determination to just keep going despite all of these challenges that you've had, but ooh, terrible. Good for you. Um, and despite these, all of these obstacles, you're still winning awards. You're still <laughs> yeah. on top of your grades. Like that's amazing. That's determination. Wow. So what? Uh, so then, eventually, you went to the University of Manitoba. Yes, with uh, uh, I, uh, I came to Winnipeg in July, about eleven years ago. About there, yeah. So in July 1st, I, you know, came here and I wasn't actually coming to school. I came here with my partner and I was, uh, you know, just uh, coming to Winnipeg because it was a little bit more inclusive towards two-spirited people. So, you know, I came here and I, my partner did go back to school and I also, you know, went with her to the University of Manitoba to help, you know, get her started. And then I thought, hey, wait, wait a minute, I should go back to school too. So <laughs> that's when I was able, I went to the Aboriginal Center and uh, uh, for the very first time met Carl Stone. Um, he'll always, I'll always remember him. Um, so basically he's like, okay, well, what do you want to get into? And I said, well, you know, I was really interested in business. And so from the fifth floor of the main building, he kind of pointed with his lips and said, you know, that's basically, you have to go that way. And I had to go find Asper School of Business. So he said, um, and you'll meet a lady named Roxanne Shuttleworth and she'll be able to help you. So off I went. And then he said, if you get lost, just come back. Um, so I found uh, Roxanne's office and like, like lo and behold, she was sitting there and then, you know, I walked in the room and, arms open and big hug and she basically invited me into the office and that's where you know I started um, with the Aboriginal Business Education Program at the time it was called. It's now changed to the Aboriginal Business Education Partners. Okay. So at that time Roxanne was a program coordinator um, and she just uh, you know embraced me and basically we started getting on with the you know what do you um, the application and um, getting my transcripts from Brandon and so that's kind of how my journey at the Asper School of Business started. Um, mm -hmm. We went through, uh, at first I could, because there's a, a system within the Asper that you have to go through track one or track two um, in order to get accepted into the faculty. Mm -hmm. So I had to actually do, an, I had to go into the arts first but I was still a part of the Aboriginal Business Education Program because they were transitioning me into getting into the faculty. And how did I? Okay, so I got actually rejected five times first from Masper before they actually accept my application. I actually appealed it the fifth time. Um, like I didn't give up. And then finally the fifth time when I got rejected, uh, I went into Roxanne's office and I'm like... <laughs> bawling my eyes out and she just like she listened to me this is this is basically Roxanne is basically she let me have my little pity party then she says well what are you gonna do about it <laughs> so basically when I got yeah when I got rejected I was like okay well and then she was well appeal it and so I was all like well what if they don't accept me because I said this kind of hurts every time you get that letter of like we unfortunately you know and I was already almost done my degree um, within if you look at commerce I was just gonna kind of going along um, but if you're not in the faculty you actually get um, you don't get to choose the courses you guys you kind of get what's left over so I always got what was left over and sometimes it's professors that people don't want to take so I just basically would you know register into those because they would allow others who aren't a part of the faculty to register for them so that's what I did and when I appealed it it was actually the late Reg Alcock who uh, 
who actually was at the time, um, you know, I'm grateful for him and as well as for what he did for me because he, he invited me into his office and he heard my story out and he, we went through my transcript and it actually uh, was a mistake of uh, the, the university this time around that they didn't uh, look at my transcript properly because they didn't see that they had the intro to psychology. So I wasn't going in through a track one. Um, so we fixed that. And then come Monday morning, that was a Friday when he sat down with me come Monday morning, I was able to, you know, get into uh, any course I wanted. Uh, so basically he said, you know, you've been trying, he said, you're probably one of the ones that, you know, should be in this faculty because of your determination and not giving up and, you know, continuing on to try and fly, um, do all the courses you needed yeah. that, you know, this was uh, something, you know, and so basically he allowed me to choose any instructor I wanted. It was almost my last, my last year. So he said, basically you have free range, choose a course. And if they're full, then, you know, we're still going to get you in there. So it was, it, it made me feel proud all of a sudden because I was like, wow, somebody actually, uh, I always, I, I went to visit his wife and I, uh, after his passing and I wrote him a letter when I graduated, like he actually passed away before my graduation, but he was going to be my honorary guest at my uh, dinner because he if it wasn't for him and and believing in me as a you know an indigenous Cree woman from northern Manitoba I don't think I would have been able to get my commerce degree wow that's beautiful wow your determination is impressive Vanessa seriously it really is because I I would have given up like (laughs) yeah and I haven't even like we were talking a little bit before we went live and and uh I'm not even yeah, ready for that kind of cool university kind of world, but good for you. So okay, so let's talk a little bit about culture and uh what is your connection to culture and, and did that come from your childhood and and how do you keep that going for yourself and, and what does culture mean to you? Well, growing up, um, like, um, I wasn't like, if you look at spiritual, cultural, like, you know, ceremonies and sweat lodges, I didn't grow up with that. I grew up with a lot of values of, you know, my, my grandparents and my parents instilled a lot of, uh, um, values within our community of, you know, respecting our elders, of, you know, um, making sure we're, you know, we take care of one another. And so basically one of the major, um, one of the major teachings that I got from my parents was to, um, basically never give up, uh, don't quit. So that's kind of where I get it from. Um, <laughs> no matter what, just can continue on, uh, doing, um, but also to take care of people, like basically if you have, you know, a last piece of bread, um, you give it to the other person. Um, so that's kind of how they taught me was that, you know, um, have, you know, take care of uh, those around you. Um, if, um, so that's that's kind of how I've been able to carry myself and, you know, uh, make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I need to do for the community. Um, so, like I said, uh, my mom, my mom is a, uh, a Catholic. Uh, my dad is United. So, we basically grew up um, in the church. Uh, I always, you know, that's kind of where um, a lot of my Cree comes from because I was able to sing Cree hymns growing up. So I really enjoyed that, uh, and then just being around grandparents and going out camping and being so that's kind of where I guess you can say we're like a trapline culture where in my community where we um, we go hunting, we go fishing, you know, we we live off the land and stuff like that. Um, and then when I came to actually the University of Manitoba, it was the very first time I actually went into a sweat lodge, um, and it was with uh, Elder Roger Armet. And he, uh, he's a two-spirited elder. So, uh, when I went into the sweat lodge, it was the first time, I guess I felt comfortable as a two-spirited woman. Um, because, you know, before I was kind of, you know, uh, it was hard, you know, coming, you know, coming out and who I truly was and my identity as a two-spirited person. So when I was at the university, I was able to uh, go into the sweat and I felt at home when I went into the sweat lodge with Roger because I felt that I wasn't judged. It wasn't a lot of, you know, it was basically, I was going there for healing, you know, for cleansing and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then further to that, uh, Roxanne Shuttleworth, uh, her being the program coordinator, but she also became, you know, um, 
a very, very good friend of mine and a very good uh, traditional teacher. So she was able, she, uh, you know, took me to ceremonies and, you know, uh, I just kind of tagged along with her. And she was also uh, the one that took care of me when I did my first fast and, you know, taught me a lot of the teaching. So I kind of, you know, throughout uh, became uh, her, I guess, scabe and her helper. And so through that, I was able to now, um, whatever, you know, I felt right and how I felt, you know, what some of the things were that I was learning that, you know, would stick with me. I, you know, I embraced it. So that's kind of how I, you know, came, became introduced into um, ceremony was, you know, basically because I had attended the university and met elders there at the University of Manitoba, amazing elders. And throughout um, my education there, I was able to meet a lot of elders um, and community people. You know, you get connected to the community. And just being in Winnipeg um, and all the different ceremonies and the different, you know, um, vigils and the different things that occur, I was able to, uh, you know, learn a little bit more about um, what, what, what walking in my, you know, walking in my shoes felt like and what was, you know, what, what I would choose for my path, even though, you know, I did grow up in a community uh, where there was there was not a lot of that. Um, this was my journey and it continues to be. Uh, we're learning about my culture and my identity and who I am as a Indigenous Cree woman and being two-spirited because that's the next journey of like learning those teachings. Um, so I'm really looking for, you know, some elders who can, you know, help guide me in that area. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So can you tell us uh, in, a, in a few words for people that don't know, what does two-spirited mean? In a few words, two-spirited, well, I'm going to say personally, uh, as uh, me identifying as a two-spirited woman, like, if you look at it, I guess, uh, sexual orientation way, it's lesbian, but for me, two-spirited, um, actually, I, it means that, you know, I, I, I do, uh, I carry, I, I carry this, uh, um, like there's a lot that comes with it traditionally, like you're a visionary, you're a healer. So that a lot of those stuff that uh, I would like to learn, um, but for me, two-spirited is, you know, who I am as a person, uh, regardless of, you know, who you love, love is love, right? So um, for me, I just, uh, I, I kind of, you know, I do um, embrace, you know, um, who I am as a two-spirited person. Like, I, I don't really want to, like, coin the term. So yeah, no for problem. me, I always say that, you know, I, I'm Vanessa. I, uh, yes, I do, uh, you know, fall in love with women. <laughs> but that's basically, for me, it's, it, it is just uh, kind of how, uh, you know, who I am and how I carry myself and the way I walk. And, um, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. I didn't mean to to put you on <laughs> no, that's okay. I was like, hey, <laughs> no. Yeah, but, it, but it's a phrase that people hear that they don't know what that means, right? So I'm, uh, I'm inspired that you found that, you know, that, that path to being who you are, right? That's so important as, as women and as beings to just be free and feel safe about who we are. So, so I honor you for that. So let's talk a little bit about um, what what does the next few years look like for you? So you've taken a lot of education. You've won a lot of awards. And I, I would probably, I have uh, your bio kind of in chunks here. But um, yeah, you've got lots of designations and degrees. Why don't you list that for us? Okay. So <laughs> I guess uh, from my grade 12, I also have uh, a certificate in um, Indigenous Women in Community Leadership, which was uh, I took through Cody um, Institute in Nova Scotia. So we were the first, uh, I guess, uh, cohort to go through it. So there was 12 of us women who took it in 2011. Um, I also have um, a technician Aboriginal Economic Development certificate through uh, CANDU, which is a national organization. Um, so I used to work for them with their certification coordinator. So I was able to get designated through that. Um, and at the time when I got designated, there were 16 competencies. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to help them uh, in their transition and look at uh, looking at 11 competencies and then incorporating governance and land management in there. So I had the opportunity to uh, work alongside uh, the education committee there. 
I also have my Bachelor of Commerce, um, and that's through, again, Asper School of Business. Um, I uh, majored in Aboriginal Business Studies, um, and then I just completed my Master's in Development Practice, Indigenous Development at the University of Winnipeg. So, yeah, so I was able to, uh, I guess, with my Indigenous Women Community Leadership, I graduated in the East Coast. When I got my TAID certification, um, that was in the West Coast. <laughs> so I always tell my nephews, I graduated the East Coast, West Coast, and in the middle. And so, you know, and a lot of times, a lot of what I do and I, I is, is really not just for me. It's for my nephews and, you know, the, the people who look up, look up to me. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, why I kind of go through these things and do the, yeah, it, it's a little bit hard. Like I, there is a lot of challenges that I face and struggles, but the way I look at it is that I don't want those that are coming behind me to kind of experience the same type of thing. So if I could make it a little bit more better for them and, you know, uh, you know, raise my voice as I'm going along for those that are coming behind me so that it's not a such a tough uh, path for them, yeah. then, you know, that makes me feel a little bit better. So I always look at my nephews and I always look at, you know, the young ones that are, and my cousin, like my, right now, my cousin's graduating from, well, we have this little graduation in our community when we transition to go out to high school. So she's right now uh, um, going to be a valedictorian for that class, which I was too. So it, for me, it makes me proud to have, you know, uh, a cousin that's, you know, younger than me, kind of, you know, kind of doing the same things I, I, I did when I was younger as well too. So, uh, you know, I'm proud of her. She's the, the graduations today. So it, it, those are little things that I, I kind of aspire to look out for is uh, those are that are, are doing things like, what feeds my spirit is when, you know, our people succeed um, and when they do things that, you know, and they, they reach their goals. So for me that, you know, um, it's amazing to see, you know, a lot of um, different uh, graduations. And if I could just go sit at all the graduations, I think that, that, you know, that would feed my spirit. I'd be happy. So, yeah. Good for you. Like what a responsibility for this generation. Hey, and mm -hmm. for, for people who are coming from communities like you and, and you're right going through all of these things and really paving those paths so that the younger people in your family and in our communities, that, that path is already made there, right? Really, you know, and it really reminds me of how much we need to continuously honor our elders and our leaders in our communities that, that continuously, and they've been doing these things for years. So, so way to go. You've done so many amazing things. That's exciting. Okay. So I don't want to keep you all day as much as I would love to, but <laughs> let's talk about uh, let's talk about work. So you're graduated and and you're not like you're not going to back to school in the next couple of months. Um, so what what kind of work are you hoping to do with your designations, with your degrees, and all of your experience? You've you've created foundations like the. Um, uh, what is it called again? Manitoba Moon Voices, which is a beautiful organization. So, what is your hope for what you want to spend your time and your energy doing? I guess uh, if you look at also Manitoba Moon Voices, like um, for me, it's uh, basically what I'd like to do is just do more of uh, community development stuff, business development. Uh, you know, looking at uh, you know working with communities uh, to, you know, help them in different areas, such as, you know, proposal writing, uh, program management stuff. So, you know, for me, like the word building capacity, because I don't, you know, I don't necessarily like that word. Why? Because I think our communities already have the capacity. It's just now further trying to um, help them. Because for me, I always said that, you know, I kind of, it's about playing the game, right? It's about looking at, uh, um, the non-indigenous mainstream world and how do we um, what we already have and how do we bridge that to to uh, to that mainstream world that you know is a part of business right so that's where the business stuff comes from um, but the thing is it doesn't mean that we don't have those skills and those abilities in our communities like I said when I first started um, what I wanted to be when I grow up. Um, it came from the fact that I did see the skills and the abilities of both my parents about, you know, the, the things that they wanted to do to help the community. 
mm-hmm. but it was just that mainstream businessy side that needed a little bit more um, bridging, right? So that's kind of you know I, I like to you know help with that area because I, I you know uh, being so many you know different certificates and being in so many different institutions and learning about you know the institution and learning about um, you know working in the, the corporate side and working in the business environment. Um, I kind of do know how to play their game. Um, so what I'd like to do is, you know, help communities, help our First Nation communities um, be able to to do what they want and do what they need and what is needed for the community, whether it be, you know, a grocery store or whether it be, you know, starting to, you know, uh, develop a co-op for, you know, mechanics and different things where people can actually work in the community and having better uh, employment in our communities because right now the only really employment is, the band funding. Um, and so just further expanding to that and getting away from the fact that we don't have to be dependent on this funding, that there's other means and other ways. So just, you know, helping them out in that area. So that's kind of what I mean by community development. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a community that's affected by uh, Manitoba Hydro um, and our uh, the dams that are affecting our community and our waterways. So development in our community is actually a really negative word. Um, but to look at it as um, like my master's is master's in economic, um, a master's in development practice, uh, indigenous development. So sometimes when I say that to indigenous people, it kind of gets a little bit uh, like, oh, development, because it is a negative word, because uh, economic development has totally reshaped our landscape up in northern Manitoba. So I think that looking at it and saying, well, no development from the fact of like, if you want to be a hairdresser, how do we do that entrepreneurial stuff and help you, you know, um, make sure that, you know, you're doing that in your, your, your in your community. Mm-hmm. So those are the type of things I would like to do. And just basically just what are different trainings that are needed in the community that we could take to them? Because really, we don't want people like I had to leave my community for education. I haven't had the opportunity to, you know, go back to my community. Um, but it's like there's a lot of people who have families who, who would like to stay in the community. So how do we bring that to the community uh, level rather than them always having to come to Winnipeg to get training? I'd like to have it in, in the community in the comfort of their homes and their community where, you know, we could experience what it's like to be in their first nation community. So, you know, some, some of the work that I like to do is around that area. Excellent. That's so wonderful. I'm so inspired to hear that. So we talked quickly uh, before we went live about the calls to action. And uh, from my view, from what I see with, mostly with my involvement with the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce and the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, because that has really allowed me to have a, a platform between two cultures and and that opportunity to bridge. And so for years, just like you, I've been aware of many of these issues and doing my own learning and my own education. And um, it, But since the calls to action, what I recognize, and I'm, I'm wondering if you feel the same way, but there's a much more a warmer discussion, right? People are, what I'm seeing is people are more open to saying, well, tell me, right? Like, well, I want to know and what can I do and that sort of thing. And my my area of passion is really um, employment opportunities, creating opportunities and bridging opportunities whenever I can. And, uh, and then as a trainer and, um, you know, kind of hosting this webinar, my goal is, is to really provide education and uh, and provide that networking opportunity so that people are seeing, uh, you know, because because my audience might be a different audience than the story that you're sharing or the, the audience that you're sharing your story with. So now I'm introducing it to a new audience that might not know, like, how do you talk to a, a person from northern Manitoba, right? How do I find them and that sort of thing? So with all of that said, and with the back to the calls to action, those are my areas. So employment and training, that's where I feel like I'm really passionate about. So what what would you say is um, for call to action 92 number one, where when we're talking about consultation, building relationships with First Nation communities and corporate, like, do you find that that's an area that you're going towards? Well, that's an area that's probably strongly needed. And that's kind of, you know, basically um, 
like if you look at the big corporation of Manitoba Hydro, not to pick on Manitoba Hydro, but the fact is that, you know, um, they're to, to, if they were to, um, I always say that, you know, a lot of times when you look at uh, the duty to consult, um, a lot of decisions, um, if you look at just recently, there was a lot of uh, uh, flooding up north and they did blame the, um, what you call it, uh, the, the, the thawing of the ice, but actually it was a raise in water level. So a lot of our communities still experience um you know, from when back in the 70s when my community was flooded, there wasn't a lot of consultation at that time to uh, to inform our community members that this is what's going to happen. This is how your community is going to be affected. Um, and our community has been socially affected. Like if I look at it now from a business lens, um, I would have, you know, if I would be able to go way back there, I would basically say that, you know, um, the corporate tax that Manitoba Hydro pays towards the federal government should actually go towards our communities. And then, you know, that would further fund a lot of programs over communities and provide us employment opportunities. 4% is not a lot, but if you're a billion dollar company, it actually is a lot and as well as royalties they should have been paying royalties in our community and continuously because we like to this day we continually get flooded they did provide us you know some million dollars uh settlement way back when when the northern flood agreement was signed but i don't think you know i um that stopped at a certain point um so my nephews don't benefit from that yet they still have to you know experience the devastations that economic development has caused in our community so I think that with that duty to consult free prior informed consent, any uh, business deals, um, I think even historic business deals need to re be really looked at again. Um, there's no saying that, you know, uh, if you look at now UNDRIP and all these different things that, you know, we utilize those documents to say, hey, back then you didn't consult with our community. But now, you know, that was the time we're speaking up. Our voices are being heard now. Um, I think you need to revisit those things because, our communities are still being affected. We're still living in poverty. We still don't have any um, economic benefits in our community. And yet you're still, you know, thriving from our natural resources. So, you know, that I think, you know, there's a lot that needs to be uh, looked at in um, especially the communities that have been, you know, kind of left in the dark and, you know, pushed aside to say that we've already dealt with you way back when. Um, but again, if you look at the Kias project right now, it's still going to affect my community and our waterways because, you know, the Churchill River diversion is the one that, you know, feeds downstream. So I think if you look at corporate, if you look at anything, like even with uh, banks, with uh, um, the telephone lines, like they, you know, go through our communities. So I think a lot of that needs, they need to come to our community to, to, uh, to talk about uh, these uh, the TRC calls to action and uh, actually uh, put them put them to to use because um, they're there. Um, I think uh, now it's uh, the the action piece needs to happen, right? Uh, the talking needs to stop and the action needs to start happening. So yeah, for sure. So do you speak your language? I understand it fully if somebody were to speak it. Um, I, I can sing it, um, but I actually, uh, I can speak uh, a bit of it, but it takes me a little bit uh, to kind of, you know, think about it and then, um, you know, start speaking it. So I, I do, I do a little bit of conversating. I understand it though. Like when my, uh, when my granny speaks to me in, in, in Cree, I actually can uh, understand what she's saying. I do answer in English sometimes. But. <laughs> And uh, so what would you say to non-Indigenous businesses about hiring Indigenous students? What kind of advice would you give to them? So for non-Indigenous businesses to hire Indigenous students, um, if you look at uh, as well as um, if you look at even my master's program and the, the international Indigenous, but also the non-Indigenous students that I went to school with, um, the number one thing I told them is that you're never going to walk on this land on Turtle Island without uh, coming across an Indigenous person. So I think with a non-Indigenous businesses, there's never going to be a time where you're not going to have to deal with Indigenous people. Um, and as well as uh, you are uh, on Indigenous land uh, running your business. So uh, for me, I think, you know, it, it's it's important that you, you do have uh, Indigenous uh, faces in your, your company because, um, 
it, the, the time is now because there is a like you know uh, if you if you look at employment opportunities if you look at the poverty levels if you look at these different things i think uh you know giving those opportunities uh to us indigenous people um like i said you know i have my master's and i think i'm gonna have a little bit of a hard time finding a job um but uh people said you know you, you do have your master's and i said yes but you know sometimes sometimes i, I kind of worry because i'm indigenous that they're not going to hire me because i've come across that so many times where you know uh you just get discriminated against because you're an indigenous person. Um, but, you know, hopefully that, that changes and I just, you know, uh, give us an opportunity. We do have, you know, the credentials. Uh, I always said that, you know, having those piece of papers proves to them that, you know, yes, I can. <laughs> um, yeah. So, And I think yeah. if anyone can prove that, definitely you can. I mean, with all of this determination that I've heard from you today, so, okay, so the last thing that I'll ask you is what would you say to Indigenous students who are thinking of going into school and are scared and nervous? I guess I'll give you the same advice that my parents gave me way back when, when I was a little girl. Uh, never give up. Um, also, you know, uh, just believe in your dreams. Believe in uh uh, your goals, uh, whatever you want to be, you can be that person. Um, if you ever have any, uh, like my best thing was having a support circle. I had a lot of support where, um, you know, I, I, I developed my community when I came into Winnipeg because, um, I knew I wouldn't survive in this big city if I didn't have my close knit community that I was so used to back home. Mm -hmm. So getting friends together or getting, you know, uh, teachers or, you know, guidance counselors, people who are going to support you here. Um, just, just find those people and don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, that was one of the major thing was I was too shy to ask for help before, but when I did, it was, it just, it, everything just fell into place. Um, also, if you ever need help, if you ever need somebody to talk to, uh, I am here. I'm available. That's one of the things that I, I said to myself and I promised myself that is that I would help any um, the Indigenous students that are going to university because I have to go through those loopholes and there's different things. There's the, you know, you have to learn to play the game as well there too. Um, and as well as there's a lot of scholarships out there. So if you're struggling financially because for uh, my community, uh, when you get banned funded, you get six seventy five a month to survive. Um, and that's like the when the cap happened, uh, they never really uplifted that cap. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't let financial difficulties discourage you. There's a lot of scholarships out there. Just, you know, go for them. There's there just go and ask, you know, your uh, academic advisor um, within the Aboriginal, you know, student services there. Basically, what I'm just trying to say is that uh, finish finish your school, finish that degree. Um, unfortunately, that is the world that we live in today, uh, that we do need that education. Um, and we do need that, that piece of paper. Um, and the more we have of Indigenous students, I think uh, the better um, our communities will be. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending this time with me. I, there's still uh, people that are watching live. So if you have any last comments or anything you want to say hello, please do that. But thank you, Vanessa, for spending this time with me. I am so inspired and I'm so thankful for you to share your story with me and, and with my Insights Inc. project. And I think Thanks. that um, you're, you're so determined. You've already accomplished so many amazing things in the education world. I have no doubt that you're going to accomplish amazing and really great things in this time because I I feel like as, as much as I want to be prepared for this time of truth and reconciliation, you have the education, you have that real experience of of that those racist experiences, and uh, and I just I just really encourage you and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and also I didn't do it alone. There's so many people that like. That, that are out there that have helped me. I have fell on my face a lot of times. Uh, and it's those people who actually reached out their hand and picked me up and brushed, helped me brush me off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of different things that have happened in my life that uh, I, I don't know how I'm still sitting here today with a smile <laughs> on my face. <laughs> but I think them, uh, those friends and those family and the people who've been there for me 
you know, when times got tough, when I wasn't uh, wasn't so strong as you know uh, a lot of people think that I am. Um, some people say I'm privileged because I have the education, but I'm like, eh, there's a lot of things that I went through to get that. Um, and don't let anybody discourage you and uh, anything you do. Um, avoid the crab in a bucket syndrome because for me, I think everybody should be passing that finish line. So that's my you know final thoughts. Is that you know uh, I'm thankful and grateful. For all the people that I met in my path, because those are the ones that have helped me continue walking this crazy world um, and continue to to guide me and uh, help me out along the way. Great! Okay. Well, you're doing amazing. You're making Indigenous women proud, and I really believe that the work that you're doing in your own life is really demonstrating to other Indigenous women that opportunity to keep going. So. So again, yeah. thank you, and I can't wait to see you in person again and give okay. you. <laughs> thank you during this time. And so, how can people reach you? How can students or uh, future employers? How can they reach you? Um, you can reach me at a well on Facebook, um, V E E Tate, um, and as well as uh, um, my email is uh, Tate T A I T V E E at gmail dot com. And um, basically, I'm in a lot of community events. So if you see my spiky hair, just come and, you know, give me a hug and say hi. But yeah, um, for the most part, that's those are the ones, uh, the places to call. Uh, oh, you can also even give me a phone call on my cell phone if you'd like. 204-583-1922. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Jessica. Have a great day and talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. Bye. Wow, that was amazing. And you know what, this is why, like, you know what, to tell you the truth, there's times where I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm busy, I'm looking for work, looking for new contracts and that sort of thing. I love the work that I do. But this is a project that I can continue to do. Um, I'm available for sponsorship, I'm looking for sponsors so that more people can hear these stories, more people can hear the inspiration from Vanessa and from the other speakers that we've had and, and the sp speakers that I'll continue to have. We're going to be talking about tourism next week and uh, Re Reconciliation Canada and I'm just I'm super excited to be doing this project. Please join my Facebook page and Indigenous, nope, Insights Inc with Jessica Dumas. Um, that's a separate thing that you have to sign up for in addition to this webinar. Thank you for watching this webinar. Thank you for being here. If there's someone that you would like to see interviewed on here, let me know. I love hearing some of your feedback about some of the topics and people that you want to want to see on here. And, uh, and I'm so excited and I'm so honored to have spent that time with her and with Vanessa and to, um, to feel her passion. And I think that the more that we can share these stories, the more people can be inspired, the more youth that can be inspired, and the more that we can really have understanding in this time of reconciliation. So I hope that you have a beautiful and wonderful day and weekend. And I hope that you join me again next Friday. Have a great day.